Good evening and welcome to the Graduate Center. I'm Jim Meiskins. I'm the interim president here at the Grad Center. And I especially want to welcome Amber Scora, who has written, as you well know, a powerful and brave book, Leaving the Witness. Thank you, Amber, for being here tonight, for sharing your story. Your perseverance against the odds is truly inspirational. So thank you. We look forward to hearing from you. We're delighted to welcome guests from across CUNY, including Hunter College, the representative right here, Jared. Good to have you with us. And where Amber was a student, she's a BA student, but her home campus was Hunter. Now, as many of you know, the Graduate Center is primarily a graduate degree institution. We have more than 40 masters and PhD programs here, but <clears throat> we're also proud and that we are the home of the CUNY Baccalaureate for Unique and Interdisciplinary Studies. I didn't know it was that long a title. <laughs> That's the BA, CUNY BA. So <clears throat> it is a university-wide undergraduate degree, which we're glad to have housed here. It's as unique and as dynamic as CUNY itself. <clears throat> now, I know we have a number of current CUNY BA students in attendance. Raise your hand if you're currently a student. Great to have you here. We also have CUNY BA alums. And that includes our moderator this evening, Mohamed Bazi, an esteemed journalist. He's now a professor at NYU. And Mohamed, it's truly an honor to have you with us this evening. Thanks for being here. Again, welcome, everybody. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the academic director of the CUNY BA, Dr. Kim Hartswick. Uh, Kim has been the director here of this very special program since 2006. He's a former professor of classical and Near Eastern archaeology at George Washington University. He himself is a CUNY graduate, uh, having earned an MS in higher education administration from Baruch College. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kim Hartswick. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you, President Meiskins, and thank all of you for coming this evening to CUNY BA's first public event of the new academic year. We hope you will be able to attend other CUNY BA presentations that are being planned, particularly one in the spring semester in collaboration with the Bard Prison Initiative and a new PBS documentary called College Behind Bars, which is produced by Ken Burns. As President Meiskins mentioned, CUNY BA is an academic degree granting program in which students collaborate with faculty mentors in developing individualized concentrations by completing coursework at various colleges and in different departments within the City University of New York. It's not surprising, therefore, that CUNY BA students are not only academically impressive individuals, but also are self-motivated and nonconformists. Exemplary examples are tonight's two guests. Mohamed Batsi, a Lebanese-American award-winning journalist, came to the United States at the age of 10, becoming an American citizen in 1994, and three years later graduating magnum cum laude from CUNY BA and from Hunter College. So when Mohammed telephoned me less than a year ago that he had someone whom he thought would thrive within the CUNY BA environment, we immediately jumped on his suggestion. Like Mohammed, Amber Scora is a writer, an immigrant from Canada. Does it count? <laughs> I know I'm pushing that, but she is an immigrant. A new American citizen, a CUNY BA student whose home college is Hunter, and I can confidently anticipate because of her present 3.96 grade point average, she will also graduate magna cum laude. <laughs> so they have a lot in common. We are proud and honored to welcome Amber and Mohammed as 
two truly impressive examples of the more than 8,000 CUNY BA students who have earned individualized degrees in the greatest urban university in the world. So sit back and enjoy the evening. I, I want to start with uh, the conclusion of the New York Times uh, Sunday book review of Amber's book by um, C.E. Morgan. She teaches us in how integrity is determined not by assenting to the juvenile claims of fundamentalism, but by enduring the universe as we find it, breathtaking in its ecstasies and vicious in its losses, without recourse to a god. Given, given the enormity of her grief and the wholesale collapse of her previous belief system, the intellectual integrity that Skora displays is nothing short of a miracle. That, let that praise sink in for a minute. Um, and I'm going to ask Amber, just how did you decide to write this, knowing that you'd have to expose such deep parts of yourself as a Jehovah's Witness? You had been, um, you had been sort of told to keep that sequestered away. Yeah, it was hard. Even though I had left the religion for a number of years before I had started writing this, there's something about, even when you maybe in, uh, sort of deprogram religiously from a community, there was still this sort of a bit of, still a bit of social indoctrination or something where uh, when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're taught that the greatest sin you can commit is not, you know, say like murder or child, these kinds of sins. The worst sin on the hierarchy of sins is apostasy. And apostasy would be not only just leaving your belief system and losing your faith, but also becoming public with that. So that was kind of a mental hurdle that even though I didn't believe it was true anymore, I wasn't afraid of dying at Armageddon for writing this book, which I would have been a few years before. Um, I still felt this weird sense of, a, a sense of like having that, really fully owning that identity of being an apostate was kind of scary because apostates in our religion were painted as people who were um, mentally diseased and evil and this type of thing. So while my community, when I left it, as these communities do, they all shunned me, um, there was still this sense of feeling um, a tie, like an emotional tie to the past or to the people that I knew would feel betrayed by the fact that I spoke out. So it was something I had to, overcome. And I think the good thing about writing a book is that it happens so slowly, it takes a long time, that you don't start out thinking about the end. Like, I, I didn't start out thinking about that the New York Times would ever review it, never did I imagine that would happen. Um, but it's a slow pro like progress. As you work through the book, you're also kind of working through your feelings about the book. And also, I think you write it in your, for me, like my bedroom, <laughs> and you don't, you sort of detach from where it's going to end the up, the readership. Yeah. Um, and there's, you kind of need to do that, I think, as a memoirist. But I did struggle with it. In the same review, they talked about the fact that um, there were things that I think I could have revealed that were maybe you know, more you know, difficult or embarrassing for people or, you know, I don't know, revelatory, something like this. But I struggled with you know, not wanting to hurt people gratuitously while wanting to still be honest and tell the story. But ultimately, what I think, I, when I had left my belief system, so much of what I had lived before felt like it had been a myth or even a lie, that there was this sense where it just felt important to me to be honest and be honest with myself and be honest about you know, what this kind of religion does and how it affects people um, and just get that out into the world. In every step of the writing, sort of every day in your room writing this, you were thinking about revealing this grander truth, but you were thinking about ways you would protect individuals. Kind of. I, I was trying to essentially be harder on myself than I think I was on other people. I wanted to be honest. And so really, I think when you write the memoir, a lot of it is um, processing these things and making sense of them through your own eyes. But I just wanted to be fair to other people. And maybe sometimes I, you know, it's a hard balance to find where you know, you, I just tried to take the responsibility for where I could. Were there moments? Um, when you thought it would draw you back into this, into that world that you had left so strongly and you had struggled so much to leave that world? Not really, because once you shed a belief system that is so intense and so all-encompassing, there's no going back, even if you miss certain things about it. There's a real break in your life. There was this breach. And if anything, I think what the book did for me was it took my past, which 
you know, this, this break in your life, in the timeline of your life, to have something so severe happen where all of the people from the beginning of your life are, have nothing to do with your life now, there's no overlap. Um, there, there's, there's something about that that is, feels very disjointed. And so writing the book in a way was helpful for that because it stitched together the past back into the future and it helped me to make sense of what had come before and to realize that like, you know, there's a sense where you, you leave that behind and it feels like none of it matters because I was in a world that we, I believed was gonna end and so I lived my entire life in that framework and working towards things that would matter in that world and then, you know, being in this new world where all of that didn't matter. It, it felt very disjointed. So in a way the book helped to sort of harmonize that. So you, you were taught at every turn not to ask questions when you were in the religion. Once you moved to China, and you can tell us how you ended up doing that, and, and you moved to China for the church with, with your husband, um, that move was pivotal to giving you this space to ask questions. And to, How did you find that space when you lived in China, and how did you make use of it? As a Jehovah's Witness in the United States or North America or really anywhere in the world, your life is very structured, it's very routine. Week in and week out, each week resembles the last. There's a lot of study, there's three meetings a week. You go out preaching. Um, when you do have free time, the people you associate with are only other Jehovah's Witnesses. And so your whole life revolves around the organization and um, you're very busy. So moving to China, my motive was to be a missionary. So it wasn't like I was moving there to kind of, you know, check out or travel or something. But because the work is done underground there, because obviously you can't operate freely and preach in China, um, there was just no way to facilitate the kinds of organizational structures that our religion had here. And so what that meant was that I, there was one meeting a week in a secret location. And um, other than that, you were basically on your own because Shanghai, where I lived, was a city of, is a city of 20 million people or so. And there was a handful of Jehovah's Witnesses there. So we spent a lot of time on our own and just figuring out how we would do preaching. So there's something about that mental, like break the space that that opens up for someone when you're used to this very regimented life from birth. That was like the first thing that kind of creaked the door open. Um, I think another big part of it was that I learned Mandarin to go there and preach. And I, I had learned in three, three years of Mandarin in Taiwan before getting to Shanghai. Yeah. So that by the time I got to Shanghai, I was quite, I was quite able to converse and conduct Bible studies and, and talk to people. Um, but learning Mandarin is a language which, when you're an English speaker, it, it almost requires you to excavate your mind because it's not the kind of language where you can, like with Spanish, where there's like equivalent, like you can kind of translate directly. You have to speak in an entirely different way. You have to think in a different way in order to communicate. Even when I had learned all the vocabulary and I put it all together, people would still look at me and just be like, what are you saying? Because they don't, the grammar, the thinking is different. So there was something about embodying that language. And I think that I would, it was so different that when I was now using this language to teach people these things that I felt were the truth, I started to hear how they sounded for the first time. And that was, that was strange because I don't know how many, like how many of the witnesses' beliefs all of you know, but some of them are kind of strange, like when you hear them with new ears. So there was that. And then there was also the reaction of the people that I was preaching to. Um, you know, China, here I am, this Westerner coming there feeling like I'm this bestower of truth. And as I became more fluent in Mandarin and I started to, you know, I'm a curious person and I started to ask my Bible students questions and I wanted to learn about their culture and what they thought. And the more that I understood the way that they saw the world, I realized that there, a, there was no way that many people from that culture were going to convert to become a Jehovah's Witness. There was just no overlap in the frame of reference. And then I started to have these questions about, well, we were taught that God is you know, just and uh, loves everyone the same. And I thought, it's really strange, this accident of birth, that I was born into this country and this family that was a Jehovah's Witness, and that meant that I was going to be saved. And you know, I was trying to discharge my responsibility by coming here to China, but like, there was no level playing field. Like, people who have been raised in an entirely different framework and different culture are not going to just like slide into the Jehovah's Witnesses and be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So um, I started to feel like that didn't make sense with the concept of God I had been taught even. So you, know, you don't go from being a Jehovah's Witness, or some people might, but I didn't go from being like, 
Joe's witness to atheist overnight. It's like you start to feel like, wait a minute, does this make sense? And you have these incremental shifts. So a lot of people with my story, they'll ask like, oh, when was that moment where you had the epiphany? And there wasn't really that moment. It was, you, it, you have to unravel a lot to get to that point. And that involves, as you say, a lot of questioning and being honest with yourself about the answers. It's interesting. I mean, did, do you think that the leaders of the church thought of that? It, this could all unravel. When you're in a fundamentalist religion like this, you so believe that you have the truth, that it's easy to feel overconfident and that um, nothing can touch you, nothing can take the truth away. But the, the strangest thing is that on the one hand, you're like that, but on the other hand, you're too scared to even read a memoir about leaving the Jehovah's Witness because it might break your faith because we're taught to fear anything that is critical of our religion. So it's a weird thing. You know, it's this kind of black and white thinking where, you know, you sort of, you have a, you have a sort of like a savior complex. It's embarrassing to me now, but you know, you, you're going there thinking like, I have God on my side. So I, you know, you don't, you're not really thinking about where your weakness in your armor is and what might actually take you down. Because you, you're, you're kind of arrogant if you are a person who goes to another country and is like, no, no, no. Like that thousands of years of history, just put that aside and change, convert to my 100 year old new American religion. You know. Thing. And also, like at the time, you know, I had never been to college. I, the, the thing is, I feel like it's so easy to be so confident when you know so little. I, you know, <laughs> then you, you know, now looking back, it's like, what did I not? I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, I'm going to ask you to read <laughs> a part about that, yeah. about your experience. You said, here it is. Okay. And, and set it up for us. Yeah, to set the scene. So this is, I've been in China for a while here in Shanghai. And I have some Bible students who I've found by sort of secretly first determining whether what, a person... What year is this? Tell us sort of This is like Shanghai 2006, in. probably. Yeah. So I have this one Bible student who's becoming a very close friend. And this is a scene where um, I'm with her and we're studying the Bible. We would study sort of secretly, but in public places. Um, pretend we were just having coffee and such. Okay. Um, and her name is Jean. But as time went by, I began to notice that even without her trying to teach me anything, I had begun to learn from Jean. She would share a teaching of Confucius that applied to what we were learning, beginning out of excitement, but then cutting herself off at her rudeness. I stopped the Bible study and asked her more. She taught me that many of the Christian qualities the Bible encouraged were the same as those encouraged in Confucian thought, goodness and benevolence, fairness, loyalty, cooperation, compassion. Many of the moral values Confucius held out were the same as those encouraged in the Bible. Both even had a golden rule, though theirs was sometimes called silver. I felt surprised that the same wisdom could be drawn from such different places. What had, what had started with Jean had also begun to wedge itself in my other Bible studies. When I gave them their copies of our publications and a Bible, their covers carefully wrapped so as not to alert any around us to their content, I had felt as though I was a bestower of truth a giver of happiness and the peace of mind that I had myself. I was convinced I could save them here in the noisy corner of a McDonald's or on the bench of a shopping mall. But as my Chinese improved, I began to notice that the people I studied with were reacting in ways I hadn't picked up on before I understood the culture and language to the degree I did now. Occasionally, I would feel a flush of embarrassment as I sh sensed a shift in tone as the student read across the table through a paragraph in the book. And then here's the quote from the book. As soon as Jesus became king, he threw Satan and his wicked angels out of heaven and down to the locality of the earth. That is why things have become so bad on earth since 1914. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed. 1914? The date seemed to get larger and weirder the longer we stared at it on the page. This date had been a given in my life, and its significance as the beginning of the end times was beyond question for me. And in fact, there was a whole chain of scriptures I had written down from one of our publications that I could use to prove its truth. But as we read through the paragraphs and talked about the pictures in the book, it occurred to me that some of this seemed to be to my students quaint or even silly. A look or a pause would reveal to me that some of the things I had taken as lifelong truths, things that I had built my life around, seemed just crazy to them. At times I would cringe inside when I noticed that what I said could have been insulting, perhaps even arrogant. The things I taught as universal truths completely disregarded the lived experience of much of the world's population. Creation, one God, everlasting life, stay away from worldly family members, 
marry in the Lord. There was no one in the Lord to marry here. Don't care about money. Don't get an education. They would sometimes laugh a little, especially at this last idea. If you allow yourself to start to question what you believe is the truth, it starts to have everything, like it's, it affects so many things in your life. Because for one thing, um, in a community like this, it means you know if you come out and are honest about how you feel, everyone will cut you off like overnight. Um, so you're facing the loss of your community. The stakes are very high, this is the thing. And then on the other hand, you're facing this like existential crisis, this loss of um, everlasting life. Like I lived my whole life because we were told that Armageddon was gonna come any day. Um, my mom was told she would never go to high school. It was always that imminent. And so the idea of suddenly facing the fact that I'm, I'm here I am in my 30s, you know, I've put off doing anything that I wanted to do maybe myself or even um, interests or talents I had, you know, I was told not to pursue them because we would have forever to do that. So faced with this realization that maybe that's not true, that maybe I'm not gonna live for eternities of time but only like, you know, 80 years or something, is a really terrifying prospect to sort of recalibrate your mind or your, your life. And then there's just the practical matters because all I had done was preach. So I didn't really have, I didn't have a career to speak of. I didn't have an education. And I didn't really know, although Jehovah's Witnesses, they're not like on a commune or anything, but I didn't ever have any friends who weren't Jehovah's Witnesses. So I didn't really know how to necessarily relate to people in the real world. I was taught to be fearful of them. So, you know, it's a lot. You can't, what I always say is this, like people will be like, oh, it's like so brave that you left or something. But the reality is, is that the only thing that happened is that staying became more uncomfortable than leaving. Because the more you see, the, the more you become aware. And, you know, I, was, I began to sit in those same meetings I had sat in my entire life. And I suddenly heard things that I didn't hear before. And I saw things that felt wrong. Um, you know, I thought I was living in this spiritual paradise and it all started to crumble. And so, you know, when, when a religion requires the kind of commitment that a religion like this requires, it becomes very uncomfortable to stay unless you can fake it. And clearly I'm, I'm a nonconformist. <laughs> That's why I'm here, right? <laughs> CUNY <-BA. laughs> I couldn't fake it. <laughs> I guess if you can very quickly explain a core tenet of belief, which is this, the anxiety around Armageddon yeah. and also how basically non-believers, non-Jehovah's Witnesses, are just condemned to... We're all going to die. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, if you're not a Jehovah's for the, Witness, you're going to die the non, and never get it. Yeah. Just, just if you can explain that. And, and, yeah. and then everyone else returns to Earth or stays on Earth. There isn't, it's not really well, a yeah, paradise. Yeah, it's a little different than it's, mainstream Christianity. Yes. So they believe that there's just like a small, a small number of people that are going to heaven. The Jehovah's Witnesses are going to survive Armageddon and populate the Earth and make it a paradise. But all of the worldly people will be killed. And be gone. And That's be gone. it. There's no yes. Yeah, and so it'll be a paradise of Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. So that means Prince will be there. <laughs> he was a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> you were already you were starting to live this parallel life in China because also you got a job. Yeah. You you were a podcasting pioneer. You're, That's right. <laughs> you had a podcast before they were popular, like really. I mean. Yeah, there was only a few uh, podcasts around at that yes. time. Um, there was a. A company, like a startup in Shanghai, who was teaching Mandarin by podcast, and I used to listen to it to learn Mandarin. And there was just a few people that worked there, and I ended up getting a job there. And I started a podcast that ended up being on the top ten of iTunes podcasts of 2008. Um, uh, about the podcast was about being a foreigner in China. And the interesting thing was is that I, I didn't ever tell anyone in China that I was a Jehovah's Witness, my workmates or anything, because I was, you know, undercover. Um, but the, I started this show that was got really popular really fast and still no one knew why I knew so much about Chinese culture or even why I spoke Mandarin. I just sort of had to like pretend it's like, oh, I'm just some kind of <laughs> language genius. I don't know. Like it's like people must but, have totally thought you were a spy. Yeah, the, yeah you're a Canadian I think people, passport. That was probably too. The that's that's the biggest that's tell. Right, yeah, <laughs> the biggest tell us, at least in the Middle East, that's you run into anyone book. who speaks <laughs> languages in, uh, and has oh, really? a Canadian passport. Yes. Oh, Canadian. You're totally a spy. <laughs> you a look spy. so innocent. That's yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. Um, so yeah, it was weird because I I, I I I just understood so much about Chinese culture from these 
like relationships I had that got quite intimate with Bible students, yeah. And I wonder if, if people who were very nicely and not aggressively, I mean, is anyone in the room who sort of will get a Jehovah's Witness at their doorstep of people weren't slamming the door in your face because it wasn't the nice thing to do. Did that make it easier for you to question? I mean, did that seeing that their own questions, which weren't always as direct, I mean, they're, yeah. it sounds like they were never quite that direct. No, no, they, no. Well, there's culturally there's a sort of concept in China of, of the teacher, and yeah, the teachers are really um, treated with a lot of respect. So even though you know what was my credential to be the teacher, but that was how the relationship was formed. And so, you know, like people are very respectful to you if you're showing them something, even if they're kind of like that's crazy, <laughs> like they don't act like. It. And then there's also the side where. Um, at least at that point in China, it's 10 years have gone by now, but the, um, a lot of young people were very interested in the Bible and Christianity or in foreigners and wanted to make a foreign friend. So there was also that. But what you say is true because, as you say, when you are a Jehovah's Witness in Canada or America, um, you really never get to the point where you even get to sit down and st yeah. study the Bible with someone because everyone just, just laughs at you or like closes the door. Um, so there was something maybe about you know, it's one thing to read something yourself, but it's nothing, to, something else to teach it to someone. And so maybe that was because that was the first time I had started to, to teach people and mm -hmm. notice things about what I was teaching. Yeah. You were about your father's death and uh, sitting in the back of the funeral hall at, at his funeral because at the time you were shunned by the religion, you were disfellowshipped. You wanted to be accepted back into the community again. You wanted to be accepted back into the religion. Um, this part I, I couldn't entirely gather from that section of the book, whether you were having doubts at that point or how deep the doubts might have been um, and had they been papered over just by this need to belong, by this mm. need. Just to set the stage, that was when I was younger. So long before I went to China, I was a, you know, a teenager and I ended up um, having premarital sex, which is not allowed. So you commit a sin and if you're not considered repentant enough, you are disfellowshipped. So I had been kicked out of the church when I was younger, long before I reinvigorated myself. <laughs> Clearly there was a pattern, <laughs> something was wrong. <laughs> but um, yeah, when I was disfellowshipped that time, I was only 19 and um, my dad died. And the uh, funeral was held in the Kingdom Hall. And uh, I speak in the book about it just a little bit, the way that when I went to the funeral, I had to, I was only allowed to come like, you know, before it started. And then I'm at my father's funeral, but no one spoke to me and I just had to leave, sort of slink out at the end. Um, and I think the thing that Muhammad is getting at is that um, in the book I express that I didn't, I didn't feel like it was wrong. I felt like I deserved it. And it's an interesting thing about this sort of a very high control religion or some people call it cult or fundamental, high, very fundamentalist religion is that um, Sometimes you think of like a cult or something as like, you know, there's a leader and you're held there against your will. But a lot of what happens is that you're trained to police yourself because of the belief. And so, um, my, you know, you're, you're, you're indoctrinated in this sort of worldview where even if you're, you know, if you do anything against the rules, you, you, you know how to bring yourself back in line. And that's why a lot of people say, oh, well, why didn't you just, when you were in it, you could have just read something and then you'd be able to, you know, deprogram. But you, even though there might be a piece of paper sitting right there, like this book, I would be like, I guarantee you there's Joe's Witnesses all across this city that saw this book and would be like, oh, like, I don't want to read that. So um, it's, a, it's a mechanism of fundamentalist religion where you just kind of know how to keep yourself in it because it's, the stakes are too high to leave. To turn it off. Yeah. And so that was that moment... It, it sounds like that moment of being shunned at your father's funeral made you want to resolve to not just turn it off, to go back in. Yeah, I mean, the shunning work, it's, like, it's kind of like emotional blackmail because not only do you feel like you're going to die because you still think Armageddon's coming every day if you believe it, um, but yeah, your fa if your family doesn't speak to you and the way to get back is by being back in the religion and it's a very powerful tool. And you know, the, now my sister doesn't talk to me, uh, my mom doesn't talk to me. I mean this is what happens. It's the only way for them to sort of keep the control. Mm -hmm. And they did, so once you were allowed back in 
and, and you describe it as something very matter of fact. So did you end up, you ended up at a different congregation at, yeah. uh, at that point? And there was just an announcement at the end of a service, right? Yeah, so then one you're of the allowed elders. back in. You have to sort what, of apply what, to okay. get back in. To bring this back to your journey, um, or more to the present day. Um, I think a lot of what you've tried to do in the book is to struggle with this question of how do you make a life away from um, this idea of knowing all the answers, right? That, that, yeah. this, that you, from your birth, you were told um, these are the answers. You can, you can tell us maybe a, a summary of some of those um, answers because they're, they're really answers to all the big questions that we would all have, right? And once you started down that path in China, you kind of knew you were going to end up leaving um, so how do you move on? Like, how do you find the roadmap? How do you move on from that point? I will say that's one of the hardest things, um, since I left. So it's been, I've been in New York 10 years now and I'm a very motivated person. I really like doing things in the world. I'm very curious. Um, but it is really hard to like make up that kind of lost time of having started everything when you were, you know, college when you were 18 and you embark on this career and you make connections. And so um, at first I didn't, I, I had no idea even like how, all I knew is I needed a job and I, I needed to support myself and I was working. But you wanna, one thing wonderful about New York is that there's so many smart people here. I was, feel really lucky in the end, although I moved to New York, I don't know what I was thinking that was like a really, dumb thing to do when you have no education, no connections, no money. It worked out, <laughs> I guess now. But um, one thing great about New York is that you just meet so many people who are really smart and interesting. And I just felt like a, a sponge. Like I just learned from people and I listen and I ask questions. And um, you know, eventually that took me to college because I knew that that was the way that I could sort of own it myself rather than be only relying on other people. I'm glad you brought up the decision to come to college because um, I know you had also applied, when you made that decision, you had applied to Columbia. You yeah. were accepted. You, you got a scholarship, uh, but you still would have needed to take out significant loans. Yeah. Um, and you decided to come to CUNY instead. I didn't have, because I had never done SATs or anything. I. Um, I, they put me in Brooklyn College first for one okay. semester, and then they let me transfer to Hunter. So since then, it was in Hunter, and then I got to be in the Thomas Hunter Honors Program for a while, and then I found out about CUNY BA through you. Um, but yeah, for me, if you think about it, if, can you imagine being someone in, already in your mid-30s, which is when I started going, and I thought, okay, I'll apply at NYU, Columbia. I asked people what should I do. I didn't know what, what people did to get into college, um, and then also CUNY. And uh, Columbia, yes, they accepted me, but they gave me $10,000 scholarship a year. And then I still would have been paying $20,000 a year just for the tuition. So you imagine being, it's one thing to have that debt when you're 18, it's awful, but imagine you're already in your 30s, you're contemplating finishing around 40, and then you're gonna try and pay off this debt and figure out what you're doing with your life. So CUNY for me was a godsend, for sure. A <laughs> godsend. <laughs> um, but uh, I will say this though, I still, I don't know, I've never sat in a classroom at Columbia, but I, I will say there's been so many moments where I've been sitting in Hunter College, like just the classroom is so diverse. There's people of not just young, also older. I look out the dirty windows on <laughs> Lexington That's Avenue, it's like a certain like patina, and look outside and just, I, I just think, wow, this is a wonderful, wonderful experience to be able to go to school in this city to meet, be around people that in my daily life I never would have had a chance to interact with. And I, I mean, almost everyone in my class ha is usually like first generation mm -hmm. immigrants. Um, just so many different perspectives. I took a gender religion class last semester and every you know, major world religion was represented by students in the class. Mm -hmm. So it's a really special place yes. in that way. I've never sat in a Columbia classroom either, but. I hope, I hope this isn't the clip that uh, Community TV uses, but <laughs> sitting at, in a, several classrooms uh, in, a, in a university downtown, it is, yes, it, it is remarkable that, um, how much the 
CUNY system reflects the diversity of the city compared to the private universities um, of this city. Um, and I also wanted to add that um, now that I'm in the CUNY BA program, there's sort of as another level of this because I feel like I'm this person whose life makes no sense in some ways to the, you know, to the average person. If you look at the trajectory of what I've done and the things that have happened, it, there's no way to fit it in a box. It's just, I'm so and, weird. And, <laughs> well, and this, um, is, this is the place? To... But the thing is, is that here you find this place where you can form your own degree, where it's this interdisciplinary uh, thing that is, um, really can reflect who you are. Um, it's a real relief for someone like me that has this strange background mm -hmm. because you find this place where there's mentors that see who you are and help you get to where you want to be, which is really wonderful too. I'm glad you brought up your mentors because I want to ask you something about um, your, your academic advisor. You, know, you, you told me about a conversation you had with your academic advisor not too long within the last year or so where you were in a yeah. little bit of despair this idea of the wasted years. Um, but it sounds like you, your advisor gave you a different way to look. I always liked school and always did really well at school, but even when I was in, in high school, like teachers would notice and say, oh, like you should get on this track or something. And, and you know, even I myself, policing myself would be like, no, that's not for me, I gotta preach. Um, so there was this sense when I started going to school and then found, oh, I reminded, like I remembered how much I loved school and I felt like I'm just a natural student, natural academic to some degree. Um, but you know, I'm now in my mid thirties. I want to have children. I am trying to work because I need to support myself. I'm trying to figure out the trajectory of my life. Um, and I'm trying to get this degree done. And um, there's been stops and starts for me because I had children. I had a child that died. Um, I've had a lot of things that I've had to overcome. And you know, in between going to school, I started being a parental leave advocate. Like I was doing all these things. And, and I think a sense also of where I wanted to do all these things because I, for so many years, hadn't done what I wanted to do. And anyway, but I still sometimes feel like I'm spinning my wheels because I, I haven't finished the degree and I still don't, my career hasn't really worked out and um, the book hadn't come out yet. You know, there's sort of like a lot of things in, that were in sort of flux. So I sat in her office just having a bad day when I, the first day that I met my advisor, which is Professor Sprawl um, in the religion department. And I was just like, you know, I don't, I don't, nothing makes sense. I feel like I don't know how I'm ever, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm typical like 18 year old undergrad. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> but I did tell her, I was like, you know, it's the weirdest thing. Like I have this book coming out. I'm writing an article for New York Times, but I'm also like trying to finish this paper. And like everyone in my class, like I'm so old compared to everybody else. And like, I don't, nothing make, my life doesn't make any sense. And I just feel like I wasted all this time that would have been, you know, I would have been in a different place now if I hadn't been in that religion so long. And she said, stop. <laughs> I really love this woman. But she was like, don't ever let me hear you say that again. She's like, it matters here. You just find the place where it matters. And it, like, it makes me feel really emotional because it meant so much to have someone point, like, just say it to me, point out that, like, no, just because, like, when I go, to, you know, if I'm applying for a job and people are like, what? Um, that's not the only place where your life course matters. Um, and it really changed my way of thinking. And then she just is a very practical woman and she's just like, all right, how are we gonna do this? Like, <laughs> sit down, you're gonna do this, 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 this. And it um, really helped me like shift my perspective. So there is that thing where I was in Hunter for a long time and because I'm not a full-time student, I think, um, I, you know, I'm not a traditional student. I was like doing evenings and weekends more. It's easy to kind of not, you know, no one really knows who you are because you're not really in anyone's presence that much. Um, but having this mentor now with the CUNY BA program, you have a mentor, it may, it really changed it because then there was somebody that you can go to that can see things that you can't see. Before I was sort of just like trying, taking this, taking that. Um, but that was really helpful for me too. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask. Amber, one more question and then we'll open it up to the audience. We're doing okay on time that way? Okay. Um, since your book was published, 
you've gotten rave reviews, starting with the New York Times review that I quoted at the beginning. Um, you've been on NPR, you've been on The Daily Show, you've been on the BBC, um, and many other international and national news outlets. Um, you've also heard from former witnesses, and possibly also from some current members of the church. And what's your, and it, it seems like you've become something of an unofficial, um, informal kind of advisor, counselor, potential cult deprogrammer. I thought uh, it was a cult uh, leader. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Not leader. <laughs> um, and sort of being involved in private Facebook pages, being involved in just, I guess, I think part of it is, is like just telling, giving people who were lost or felt lost and felt that they didn't have the roadmap, giving them something of a roadmap. And, and what, just what, what has that been like since the book? One thing that's been really interesting is um, how much like, more broad it is than just Jehovah's Witnesses because you don't really realize until you start talking about this stuff how many people have been raised. And even though obviously it's a spectrum, not all belief systems are as extreme as this and some are more extreme than the Jehovah's Witnesses, but there's a lot of people that identify with this feeling of having been raised in, you know, a a certain religious culture and then getting older and finding that it doesn't work for them. Um, so there's been a lot of people that have written me anything from like different fundamentalist Christian groups. Um, the ex-Mormon community is, mm. it's incredible the parallels between Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons even though the beliefs are totally different, the mechanisms are very similar. Um, so there's, it's been this really interesting process of sort of seeing how one story can be a broader story of a lot of people. And I think that's one of the really wonderful things I didn't know about being a writer is that not only do you, um, you get a really, you get a sense of fulfillment writing the book and then people read it and then they say it helped them and then them telling you that it helped them helps you. Like it's such a wonderful, I highly recommend writing a book actually. <laughs> They're revealing but very it's really deeply personal beautiful, things. It's really beautiful experience to, it, to connect with people on, around this thing and around this like sort of common human experience. Um, but yeah, more specifically, um, a lot of, I think there hasn't been many books by Jehovah's Witnesses who have left because of that reason. I think that many people are afraid to write. Uh, about the experience, and, and also because we aren't allowed to go to college, so we, you know, don't, a lot of us don't even know if we have the capability to write something. It's hard to get to that point. Um, so it's been a um, very nice uh, thing to have the opportunity to sort of feel like people, feel like their story is told. A lot of people have said that that's been, you know, wonderful for them to see the book in the world because it felt like people heard their story too. And that's a really nice People can understand thing, yeah. them. Um, okay, we're going to open the floor for questions for about 15 minutes. Hey, Amber. Hey. So, David, so I grew up in an, an extreme Judaism. I, ironically, I'm 35. For me, trying to leave extreme Judaism has been very difficult. Social media has changed the game because they have so many ways of threatening me. I'm sort of interested to hear it, it doesn't sound like the the, um, the the church has threatened you the way that I feel like I have been. So I'm just trying to get a sense of, I, rem I do remember a video, you sitting waiting to see if they're gonna email you, uh, the church leaders after you put out the book, but I'm just trying to get a sense of what that yeah, experience has been. Yeah, I think the witnesses are, they pretty much try to stay out of the limelight in that regard, and I haven't had any kind of harassment or anything, thank goodness. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't, I feel for you. That must be extremely scary. And I know that there's other people who've had that experience though with other more groups like Scientology and that type of thing. Maybe, I mean, is there a people in your specific community that you could find that have left, that have a support group or something that have been through that experience? That could be helpful. Most people I know in the extra Jehovah's Witness community find each other, as you say, on Social Facebook. Media groups, um, Twitter, this type of thing, there's a way to come together or, uh, yeah, hopefully that can help. <laughs> you need support though, definitely. And I think the best support sometimes does come from someone who has been through the experience because then you can see how to get navigate it to the other side. 
Uh, so, Amber, I should tell you, I'm an ex-Jehovah's Witness. Oh, so hi. You. I love the book. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I come up everything she said. I said, yup, yup, yup. Yeah. That's yep. <laughs> but my question is this. Um, when I left the cult, I was angry every day for about four years straight. And it, some days I was happy to be free. I was I miss my family. It was an emotional roller coaster. But anger was really the, like the, the most prevailing emotion. So that was one of the things I wanted to ask you. Like when you left, when you said, "This is it. I'm gone. Over. Goodbye." What emotional, emotionally, what was it like for you? Like, what did you go through? It was similar. I to this day, I sometimes still get angry. And I think it's important to not deny yourself that. Like, it, you have to let yourself feel angry sometimes. But for me, the biggest thing that sort of helps me and helped me to overcome that feeling and not let it control my life is that I just didn't want to spend any more energy on it because there was so much to do in the real world. And that's the thing with anger is that you, you, if you, you, know, you, be, you become wrapped up in the anger, you're still living in that cult or that world, you know? So for me, it was, it was, I think, honestly, like going to school helped a lot. You just start learning new things, meeting new people, and filling up your life. And to the point where now it's been, you know, a little more than 10 years. And uh, publishing this book kind of like brought it all back. And I realized, though, is how my life is, the, it, the religion has become this big. Like, it, it, when I first left, it was, I was like just like on the 10% like of my life felt and it took up still 90% of my headspace or whatever. But the more you build the life and the more you learn other things and slowly it just, it, it seems so small to me now. And someone asked me a question at a book talk where like, what if you could go to the governing body of the Joseph Witnesses and say something to them? And, I, and at the time I was like, I don't know, what would I say? Like, that, reform your policy, I don't know. And then I thought, no, I would be like that soccer player, oh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I wouldn't be like that soccer player that didn't want to go to the White House. Like, I wouldn't go. I'd be like, I don't even. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> so, yeah. Eventually, I just think it takes a long time, and then you heal from it. Thank you. Yes. you. Gentlemen at the end of the row. Hello, uh, my name is Jordan. I'm a XJW2. Hey. <laughs> I faded about 13 years ago, and for me, I just didn't even think about it because I thought I was the only person who had that experience, so it was kind of lonely. And for some reason, I um, came upon an article about your book, and that's what woke me up, that it was so many other people having that same experience. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Oh, <laughs> thanks for coming. And I want to ask, um, does it still affect you, having grown up in it today? Uh, I don't think, it doesn't affect me in the sense like that I have like anxiety about the world ending or anything like that, or that I think, what if they were right anymore? But it affects me, yeah, because it affected a lot of things in my life. Like it affected the fact that I had children later, that I don't, still don't really have a lot of stability that I would like maybe career-wise. And um, I feel like I can't, um, my life will never really look the way that other people's lives look, but as we always say, if all of this hadn't happened, I wouldn't have written a book. So I just, I've just tried to learn to find how to appreciate the fact that my life is just different than other people and celebrate that. And that can be like a really wonderful thing too. It's just, we don't have to be all the same. Um, I think there can be something like really nice about just embracing that and enjoying being a nonconformist. <laughs> uh, a question in the back there? Okay. Hi, Amber. Um, I'm also an ex-Jehovah's Witness. I was raised in the religion. I left 10 years ago. Uh, I can relate to a lot of what you've said, except for the China bit. Um, I haven't read your book yet. I only became aware of it a couple of weeks ago, so that's definitely going to change. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, in China, there's a lot of censorship uh, connected to the internet regarding what you can view and read. Um, so my questions are, how were you able to validate your doubts? And um, since you're a missionary, usually the governing body gives you a one-way plane ticket to the country. How difficult was it for you to get back from China to your home country? Well, the first question is a really <clears throat> interesting one because 
Yes, you can Google search in China something with certain keywords and sometimes get through once, and then the second time you go back, it'll be blocked. They do have a lot of people monitoring the internet. So there were things that I found, but you know, when I left, there, there's a lot more, because as I mentioned, it was before social media. So now there's a lot more material accessible, sort of like ex-Jewish activism or like materials. But there were a few books. Basically, I just started ordering books and getting them delivered that people that I knew in, you know, overseas, like people that listen to my show, my podcast, like that was my connection to the world was my podcast at the time. Um, sent to me, uh, and it was books that really helped me to deprogram and other people, being around normal people. And it, you'll see when you read the book that there's a whole other um, subplot in the book of starting to interact and talk about like religious things with a person who is, um, be, I become very close to. So other people play a huge part in this story. We need other people, and that's why I think that this, when you have communities like this, they often isolate you because things can't stand up to the scrutiny of people, you know, people that questioning them. And so I think it's really helpful if you, you know, just being able to step outside your community. And what was that second part? I forgot. The one-way ticket. One-way oh. ticket. You, how well, did you get yourself okay, back well, home? I, now that there's so many extra, I was a pioneer, so I use the word missionary loosely. There, was, there's like all these different categories. So I, you know, okay, it was hard to get out, but it had nothing to do with the religion sending me there or not. I went on my own to go. Um, but getting out of China, it was hard because I didn't want to go home because everyone at home where I came from, Vancouver, was shunning me. Um, so yes, I ended up in New York because where else would one go? <laughs> <laughs> the good thing about New York, it's actually kind of easy to move to in a way, because you just got to rent a room. If you can get cheap rent, and then you can just eat pizza, and it's <laughs> for a long, long okay, time. Question there. Hi, my name is Zalman. I'm not an ex um, Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> You're representing? I am an ex ultra Orthodox Jew, and I actually went to China and spent a summer in Beijing doing missionary work for Lubavitch, for ultra-Orthodox cool. Jewish outfit. So there's some parallels, but yeah. some striking parallels. Um, but I wanted to just ask you, so I actually got a PhD in sociology, and my dissertation looks at ex-ultra-Orthodox Jews, and one thing that uh, I focus on in particular is or, uh, uh, some scholars call residual effects, so kind of things that stay with people even after they leave the religion, either in terms of uh, ways of thinking or even like bodily movements or things that they're accustomed to doing that were ingrained in them from the religious community that kind of stick to them even after they leave. And I'm curious if you see in yourself either ways of thinking or ways of behaving that are clearly you know, um, originate in the yes, church. I'm very good at ringing doorbells. <laughs> 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 but seriously, it does actually carry over because this is very weird. But like, for example, I, I, I wanted to buy an apartment in New York, but you know how hard that is, like a few years ago, um, always getting outbid or whatever. And I, I came up with this idea to um, put notes under the doors of a building and be like, do you want to sell your apartment? And my partner was so mortified. He was just like, are you kidding me? This is so embarrassing. Um, and I was like, just do it. I was very pregnant at the time, so I made him do it. I couldn't bend down. Anyway, someone called back and we ended up buying an apartment. <laughs> and he swears, he's like, that's because you were a Jehovah's Witness who thought of that. <laughs> So yeah, I have, I have no fears of approaching your doors. Right? So, <laughs> you got to accept the things that serve you and be happy for them. <laughs> OK, that's a perfect note to end on. But Amber is going to sign books outside, and we'll have be available for more questions. Oh, and also, Brian is going to say Brian. something, please. Yes. Let's thank Amber. And thank you all for coming. I would like to thank you all for coming out this evening. It was a really fantastic uh, Q&A session, and uh, we hope to see you again at one of our upcoming events. So have a pleasant evening.